Hi, my name is Tenzin Namjong, and welcome to the first in a series of supplementary lectures designed to complement the Heart Sutra module of the FPMT Basic Studies program. The Heart Sutra is unique in that the majority of the discourse is not spoken by the Buddha himself, but rather is spoken by the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara. So what I wanted to talk about today is who is Arya Avalokiteshvara? Is he a Buddha or a Bodhisattva? How do the various emanations of Avalokiteshvara relate to one another? And lastly, I wanted to conclude with some remarks about relating it to our own Guru Yoga practice. So Avalokiteshvara is the Buddha of compassion. In Tibetan, his name is translated as Chen Rezik, or the compassionate eyed one. So known because it is said that he looks upon all sinning beings with compassion. In general, there are many different forms or emanations of Avalokiteshvara. The most famous one being the thousand arm with eleven head version, which you see here. There's also a four armed Chen Rezik. And Chenrezig also will appear in the form of Dharma protectors like Mahakala or wealth gods like Zambala. Also, in the Chinese tradition, Kuan Yin is the same as Avalokiteshvara. So in general, Buddhas can manifest whatever type of form is needed for sinning beings at that time, at that moment, according to their needs and disposition. As it says in the Avatamsaka Sutra, or the Flower Ornament Scripture, When the moon rises, numberless reflections appear wherever there is water in this world. That is how Chenrezig manifests. Effortlessly, naturally, Chenrezig manifests in all kinds of forms. Even as medicine, a bridge, or water. Chenrezig manifesting to sinning beings in whatever form benefits them, does inconceivable work for sentient beings. Chenrezig manifests in the six syllables, Om Mani Padme Hum, to purify our negative karma and enable us to collect extensive merits, fulfilling all our wishes and bringing us to enlightenment in the quickest, easiest way. Chenrezig manifests even in Dharma protectors to protect us from obstacles and Chenrezig manifests even in wealth deities to protect us from poverty. So in short, Chenrezig manifests in whatever form will benefit the sentient beings of that particular place and time. So the story behind perhaps the most famous of his manifestations, the thousand arm Avalokiteshvara, is like this. When he still was training on the path, he made the promise to his guru the Buddha Amitabha, that if he ever gave up his aspiration to benefit sentient beings and rather just abide in the solitary peace of nirvana, may his body crack into a thousand pieces. And so there's a, a few versions of the story, but one of them goes that when he went down to the hell realms to benefit sentient beings, he saw that as many sentient beings as he was liberating from the hell realms, he turned around and saw there was many more sinning beings getting reborn there. In other words, the number of sinning beings suffering in the hell realms was not decreasing. Therefore, he became very discouraged and lost his aspiration to benefit sinning beings, whereupon his body did crack into many, many pieces. So, Amitabha Buddha put Avalokiteshvara back together again and gave him 1,000 arms, each of which has an eye on the palm of the hand, so that Avalokiteshvara could be even more beneficial to sentient beings. The Tibetans have a particularly strong relationship with Avalokiteshvara, and famously, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, as well as His Holiness the Karmapa, are known to be emanations of Chenrezig. In some contexts, we see Avalokiteshvara being referred to as the Buddha of Compassion, whereas here in the Heart Sutra, we see him being referred to as the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara. 
So just to review some of the vocabulary, a bodhisattva is a being who is not yet a Buddha, but who has uncontrived bodhicitta, or the altruistic wish to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. So a Buddha is necessarily not a bodhisattva, and a bodhisattva is necessarily not a Buddha, although Buddhas do have the mind of uncontrived bodhicitta. Then if we ask, well, which one is it? Is Avalokiteshvara a Buddha or a Bodhisattva? Then this becomes a subject of debate at the great monastic universities. So the Mahayana system asserts that Guru Shakyamuni Buddha had what are called the eight great Bodhisattva disciples. The three lords of the family, Avalokiteshvara, Manjushri, Vajrapani, as well as Maitreya, Siddhigarbha, Samantabhadra, Akshagarva, and Sarva Nirvarana Vishkambini. So the question as to whether they are actually bodhisattvas or are just Buddhas appearing in the form of bodhisattvas comes up in the monastic curriculum when we study the opening verses of the Abhisamaya Alamkara or the commentary written by Maitreya of the hidden meaning of the Prajapadamita Sutras. Maitreya, at the beginning of the Abhisamaya Alamkara, pays homage to the perfection of wisdom herself. The great Indian master, Haribhadra, asserts that there are two purposes or two reasons for Maitreya to do this. The first is so that Maitreya can show that he is in accordance with the other great and noble beings who before undertaking any important work, would pay homage to an object that is exalted in order to collect extensive merit as well as to remove any obstacles for the completion of his work. The second purpose is to instill faith in the perfection of wisdom to the disciples who are going to engage in the study and reflection on the Abhisamaya Alamkara. So later, Lama Tsongkhapa, in his Golden Rosary, the commentary on Abhisamaya Alamkara, as well as Haribhadra's commentary on it, asserts that these two purposes are the own purpose and the purpose for others. Then another Tibetan master, Rong Tikpa, finds fault with Lama Tsongkhapa's explanation and says that it is not correct to assert that Maitreya has his own purpose for composing the homage at the beginning of Abhisamaya Alamkara. Now, Gelsabje, who is one of the two heart disciples of Tsongkhapa, then in his Namshe Ningpo Gen, or the essential nectar commentary to the Abhisamaya Alamkara, then addresses the debate that was raised by Rong Tikpa. Gelsab J hypothetically asks Rong Tikpa, when you say that it is improper to assert that Maitreya has his own purpose for composing the homage in the Abhisama Alamkara, are you doing that from the standpoint that Maitreya is a Buddha or that Maitreya is a Bodhisattva? He says, if you, Rong Tikpa, are arguing this from the standpoint that Maitreya is a Buddha, then you have the fault of not being able to distinguish between the common and the uncommon appearances. If, on the other hand, you are doing it from the standpoint of Maitreya being a Bodhisattva, then you have the fault of the Bodhisattvas then not seeing their own purpose of attaining the Dharmakaya as the ultimate aim of their training on the path. So here to add some more context, I think that what Rong Tikpa is saying is that if he considers Maitreya to be a Bodhisattva, Bodhisattvas in general are solely dedicated for the welfare of others. So then Rong Tikpa would be asserting that if Maitreya is a Bodhisattva, then he would be doing nothing for his own purpose. But here, the mind of bodhicitta, it is said, has two aspirations. 
One is the aspiration to benefit others, and the second is the aspiration to attain enlightenment. Because they see that only with the attainment of enlightenment will they be able to work for the benefit of all other sentient beings in the best possible way. Furthermore, bodhisattvas are interested in attaining both the Dharmakaya, or the omniscient mind of the Buddha, as well as the Rupakaya, or the form body of the Buddha. The Dharmakaya is known as the Rangdungiku, or the body that attains the welfare for oneself, and the form body of the Buddha is known as the Shendungiku, or the body that accomplishes the welfare of others. So then to assert that if Maitreya is a bodhisattva, he would not have any thought that wishes to accomplish his own aims or his own purposes is contradicted by the fact that if he were a bodhisattva, he would want to attain the Dharmakaya, which is actually the highest attainment of one's own purpose. So from this exchange between Rongtikpa, Lamsungkhapa, and Gelsabje, then the subsequent monastic textbooks of the three great monastic seats of Sera, Drepung, and Ganden, then there is much debate about what is meant by the common and uncommon appearances. Without going into too much detail, let me just say this. The Sarah May monastic textbook asserts that Maitreya is a bodhisattva because many times in sutra it would say the bodhisattva Maitreya. The textbooks by Penchen Sonam Drakpa, which are used by Dripung Rosaling as well as Gandan Shartse, assert that although in actuality Maitreya is a Buddha, in ordinary appearances he is a bodhisattva, therefore they assert that Maitreya is a bodhisattva. The textbooks by Jetsun Chugi Gelsen, which are used by Sarah J as well as Ganden Jangse, assert that Maitreya is a Buddha because, in essence, he is a Buddha and he is merely appearing in the form of a bodhisattva to the ordinary appearances of the sentient beings. And Jetsun Chugi Gelsen uses as support of his claim two quotations. The first by Gelsab J in his commentary on the Uttara Tantra, also by Maitreya. At the end of the Uttara Tantra by Maitreya, he says that he has composed the text in order to purify the obscurations within his mind. This shows that to the intended disciples of the Uttara Tantra, he is showing the aspect of being a bodhisattva because Buddhas are completely freed from all obscurations and therefore have nothing left to purify. So in his commentary to the Uttara Tantra, Gelsabje says, although it says like that, in other words, although it says that Maitreya composed the text in order to purify the obscurations from his mind, that is only said in order to guide certain ordinary disciples but it is not the definitive meaning because the Bhagavan Maitreya has fully and completely attained the Dharmakaya and thereby attained enlightenment. Lam Tsongkhapa says in his Nakrim Chenmo, or the Great Stages of Tantra, that although in actuality one is a Buddha, it is not contradictory to not show the activities of a Buddha to the ordinary disciples. For example, Maitreya and so forth in the retinue of Shakyamuni Buddha. So in those two quotations, it clearly states, although in actuality one might be a Buddha, in the ordinary appearance of the disciples, one doesn't necessarily have to appear as a Buddha. Therefore, the system of Jetsun Chugi Gelsen, which is the system of Sarah J. Monastic University, which I follow, would then assert that since Maitreya is a Buddha, just appearing in the form of a Bodhisattva, then all eight of the eight near Bodhisattva disciples of Shakyamuni Buddha are therefore also 
Buddhas. Therefore, Avalokiteshvara is also a Buddha. So in Tibet, prior to 1959, there would be great exhibitions of debate between the various monastic universities. And one of them was done in Lhasa, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who was still an adolescent at that time, was in attendance. And Sarah Jay was debating, and Drepung Losaling was answering. So they were debating this very point of whether Maitreya was a Buddha or Bodhisattva. And the monks from Losaling, in keeping with their monastic textbooks, answered yes, that he was a Bodhisattva. Then the Sarah J monks then asked, well, is Chenrezig or is Avalokiteshvara a Bodhisattva? And you have to understand, in the Tibetan society, they view His Holiness the Dalai Lama as an emanation of Avalokiteshvara. So if they were to answer that Avalokiteshvara is a Bodhisattva, then by implication, they would be asserting that His Holiness the Dalai Lama is not then a Buddha, because if someone is a Bodhisattva, they're necessarily not a Buddha. Therefore, the two monks from Losaling, seeing the two steps down the road in the debate, did not answer and remained silent to the question whether Avalokiteshvara was a Buddha or Bodhisattva. So a lot more can be said about this debate. However, I wanted to just bring it a little bit more practical, relating it to our practice of Guru Yoga. And here, the overarching point is, although someone might be a Buddha, they don't necessarily have to appear as a Buddha to us, to our contaminated minds. As it says in the Sangata Sutra, Whatever the form by which they are to be subdued, I, meaning the Buddha, teach the Dharma in that form. In the world of the Devas, I teach the Dharma in the form of a Deva. In the land of the Nagas, I teach the Dharma in the form of a Naga. In the land of the Yakshas, I teach the Dharma in the form of a Yaksha. In the land of the Pretas, I teach the Dharma in the form of a Preta. In the world of humans, I teach the Dharma in the form of a human. To those sentient beings who are to be subdued by a Buddha, I teach the Dharma in the form of a Buddha. To those sentient beings who are to be subdued by a Bodhisattva, I teach the Dharma in the form of a Bodhisattva. By whatever form it is that sentient beings are to be subdued, I teach the Dharma in that very form. So now to relate it to Lamrim, on the section of how to devote oneself to the Guru, there it has four outlines that establish that the Guru is actually the Buddha. The first is that the Buddha said in the future he would appear in the form of an ordinary spiritual friend. The second is that the Buddhas have compassion toward all sinning beings. The third is that our Guru enacts the works of Buddhas. And the fourth is that our appearances are untrustworthy. So the upshot is, just because someone is a Buddha, it doesn't mean that they would necessarily have to appear in the form of a Buddha to us who have impure karma. How things appear to us are as much dependent on our own karma and our own minds as they are from the side of the object. So, what it means for a Buddha to appear in an ordinary form actually means in a form having mistakes. So when His Holiness the Dalai Lama says things like, I don't know, or appears not to remember a certain scriptural quotation, then that should remind us that, okay, this is just the own appearances to my mind. It doesn't necessarily mean that His Holiness is not a Buddha. In fact, the great Kadampa masters would say that how lucky we are that our Guru 
appears in a form that can teach us the Dharma. Because as it says in the sutras many times, that the Buddhas will appear as medicine, as bridges, as boats, any type of form, even as dogs or other kinds of animals that cannot communicate with us. So therefore, how kind it is that our gurus appear in ways that can communicate with us, that can give us teachings, and thereby guide us to liberation and enlightenment. And the other thing in the big picture is that we actually don't know anyone we meet, whether they are a Buddha, whether they are a Bodhisattva or some other kind of great being. Buddhas would appear in whatever form would be most beneficial for our progress along the path. So even the people who seem to be very annoying or seem to be misbehaving, they could actually be Buddhas who are just trying to show us something, teach us some kind of lesson so that we can further our good qualities of tolerance and patience. This is one other reason why we should not be so judgmental with others because what might appear to our mistaken minds doesn't necessarily have to accord with reality. Okay, so to bring it back to the Heart Sutra, Arya Avalokiteshvara is in actuality a Buddha but is appearing in the form of a Bodhisattva to the ordinary appearances of the disciples at that time. So now we need to relate that to our own practice of Guru Yoga and consider no matter what kind of mistakes appear to us from the side of the Guru, it doesn't necessarily mean that the Guru has those faults. Rather, we should always recall the kindness and qualities of the Guru and in that way maintain what is called a pure view of the Guru. Of course, if your guru gives you instructions that are not in accordance with the Dharma, you don't have to follow blindly and rather have a positive obligation to not follow the instructions that are not in accordance with the Dharma. And of course, all this talk about guru devotion necessarily requires that the student thoroughly examine and investigate a potential spiritual friend or guru prior to entering into a formal Dharma relationship with him or her. So let's leave it at that for today. Thank you very much for watching. I hope that was beneficial for you. So now at the end, let's just dedicate the merit for the long lives of the spiritual friends, the flourishing of the Holy Dharma, and that all sinning beings, vast as the vastness of space, be quickly freed from all of their suffering and quickly attain the state of full and complete enlightenment. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.